Hello, everyone. Welcome to Math Future. I love to say that. Math Future is a series of open events with people who make the future happen with our progressors. So uh, the series started in 2009. We invite interesting people and we ask them interesting questions. So today I am really happy to talk with Dr. Melissa Kibbe about early algebra. Now, this topic is very dear to me personally, uh, not only important to the future, but also uh, I, I love it very much uh, because I also work in early algebra, but Melissa works in cognitive psychology while I work in mathematics education. So um, what we are going to do now is Melissa will talk about her past studies and future studies. We can chat in uh, text and then we'll ask some questions. So as uh, people come in, uh, why don't we introduce ourselves in the chat just to say where we are from, what weather is there, what time of the day. And uh, meanwhile, Melissa, I'll just give the floor to you and uh, we will talk about uh, we will hear what you have to say. Uh, so go ahead. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, that introduction. It's uh, really exciting to be here talking to you all about the kind of work that I do. Um, as Maria said, on um, early number reasoning in kids. And I'm coming from the cognitive psychology perspective. Um, I know a lot of people here are from the um, math education side of things, so I'm really excited to get your input and um, tell you about the kind of work that I do. Um, so I want to begin just by talking about the kinds of science that inform the work that I do. So a lot of the work that I do is rooted in our knowledge that even very young infants have an approximate sense of number. So from birth, infants have the ability to detect um, that, for example, one jar of cookies has more than another jar of cookies. Um, and the way that we assess this is actually by um, looking at what babies find surprising or interesting. So, for example, we might show babies um, sets of dots on a computer screen, and we'll show them the same number over and over and over. So it looks something like this. So babies see a set of dots like this, they see another set, they see another set, and this happens over and over. And then what we do is we want to see whether babies kind of understand that they've seen the same number. And what we'll do is we'll show babies a new number. And we see if babies get more interested when they see something new and exciting. So after seeing the same numbers over and over, we'll show them a new number. And what we find is that infants find this very interesting. They look longer at, um, at displays that have you know, a different number than the displays they've been seeing over and over. So this suggests that babies from a very early age, these are infants as young as oftentimes a few days old, really do have an approximate sense of number. Um, and this is kind of what we're, what we're interested in, this, this rudimentary ability to approximate sets of objects. Can this kind of representation support our later math ability? And also, we know that as babies get a little bit older, and by older I mean five months, so they're not that much older, infants can take those take their approximate sense of number, and they can actually do some rudimentary addition and subtraction. So what, will, um, what these studies do is they typically show babies, say, a set of objects on a computer screen like this. And then the objects will be covered up, and babies will see some more objects added behind the screen. So now babies have, don't get to see what the final number is, right? They get to see one set of objects covered it up, and then another set of objects. And what the researchers do is they will lift the screen or remove the screen, and they'll show babies 
one of two possible outcomes, either the expected number, so if baby successfully added those two sets together, there should be about 10 things behind the screen, or they'll show them an unexpected number like five. And what they find is that when they show babies an unexpected number like five, babies look longer at this outcome. They're surprised. It doesn't fit their understanding of what should be going on behind the screen. So this suggests to us that even at five months, right, the, the uh, older infants of age five months, even at five months, babies already have a rudimentary ability to take their approximate sense of number and start adding and subtracting with it. So as we approach the problem of how kids learn more complex mathematics later on, we want to see whether we can get kids to harness this ability that they have from infancy, the ability to approximate sets and have a sort of estimate of how many objects are in a particular set, and their ability to combine those sets to add and subtract. So that's the approach that we're taking when we're asking whether children can harness this gut level number sense to do more difficult computations than just adding and subtracting. And specifically, what we're interested in is can children harness their gut level number sense to do something like algebra, right? And this is one of these problems that's, you know, notoriously difficult for kids as they start learning it later in school, right? And a lot of what trips them up is the symbols. There's X's, there's Y's, there's numbers. These are things that they haven't yet encountered in math, and a lot of times that trips them up. So in our recent research, we, we asked, well, you know, if symbols, X's, Y's, numbers, if that's tripping kids up, maybe they'll be able to solve for X in an algebra-like problem if we give it to them in a format that harnesses their gut level number sense. So let me show you what I mean by that. So this time we're looking at four to six-year-old kids. So um, these are kids we actually um, studied at the Maryland Science Center um, right on the museum floor, which is really fun. So these are visitors to a, a museum, science museum. And we showed them a scenario like this. We showed them a stuffed animal character, his name was Gator, and we told kids that Gator has a magic cup. And what's magic about it is that Gator's magic cup will always come and add some more things to a pile of objects. And it's always going to add the same number of things every time. So we try to let kids know that the amount in Gator's cup was a constant. But the trick is that kids never got to see what was in Gator's cup. So what we did was we showed them some objects, placed them on a little table, and then we showed kids Gator's magic cup covering up the buttons. We shook it around a little bit. And then we lifted the cup to reveal a new quantity. So in these kinds of problems, you can think about Gator's magic cup as the x variable. So kids saw several different trials with these quantities. But instead of using numbers and x's, we used different types of objects. So in the first trial, we used five buttons. Gator's magic cup came and added a certain quantity, and kids saw 17 buttons. In trial two, we used pennies. Trial three, we used shoes. And we varied the number that we started with. So each trial started with a different number. And this was just to highlight that Gator's Cup was really a constant. Then what we did was we had a test trial where we brought out two magic cups. And we said, oh, no, I found two magic cups under the table, but I don't know which cup is Gator's. Can you help me? I'll show you what's inside, and you can tell me which one's Gator's Magic Cup. So now this is the first time kids get to see what's in any cup. So we lift the cups, and we show them two different quantities of pom-poms. So kids either get to see uh, 12, which is the target quantity, paired with a different quantity, 4, or a different quantity, 24. So sometimes the, um, the wrong cup is bigger, sometimes the wrong cup is smaller. And what we found was that kids were very successful at this. They successfully chose which cup was Gator's at rates much greater than chance. So this suggests that kids had a sense of Gator's cup, the quantity in Gator's cup. Now, again, they never got to see what was in the cup during test trials or during familiarization trials, 
they only get to see the starting quantity and the ending quantity. And what we've we found in follow-up studies to this is that kids are really good at this. And in fact, they can do this for two variables. So for example, if we showed kids Gator's Magic Cup adding some things to a pile, and then we showed kids Cheetah, and Cheetah has a different Magic Cup, it has a different number of things than Gator's Cup, they see Cheetah's Magic Cup adding a different quantity to a similar pile. So for example, kids would see Gator's Magic Cup adding a certain quantity to five buttons, and Cheetah's Magic Cup adding a different quantity to five buttons. And we showed kids this several different times again, and then at the test, we gave kids a choice. We said, oh, no, I found a magic cup under the table, but I can't remember if it's gators, gators or if it's cheetahs. Can you help me? We showed kids what was inside the single cup, and they had to actually choose which animal belonged to which cup. So this is kind of nice because they have one quantity that they're looking at, and they have to remember which was cheetahs and which was gators. And kids, again, succeeded. They chose which animal belonged to which cup at rates much greater than chance. Furthermore, we actually found that they can do this for up to three variables. So this isn't something that we published, but it was almost something that we did just to see. Kids could actually do um, uh, three, they could actually match one magic cup to one of three, mag one of three particular animals. So this is uh, pretty cool. It suggests that kids are able to keep track of multiple variables all at once using their approximate sense of number. Now these are four to six year olds and these kids are, some of them have just started school and some of them are in kindergarten, a lot of them are in preschool. But we also wanted to look at slightly older kids. So kids who are seven to nine years old who maybe are starting to encounter this type of problem in school but haven't really had much experience with it. And we wanted to see whether kids could, in this kind of Gator's Magic Cup scenario, whether they could create and generate an estimate for how many things were in the cup without ever having seen the cup. So again, we gave seven to nine-year-olds the, the task where we showed them, here's Gator's Magic Cup, here's Cheetah's Magic Cup. But this time, instead of just letting them watch, we asked them to guess, write down your best guess, how many items do you think were in the cup? How many things do you think the cup just added? And um, we gave kids, you know, a cute little scientist notebook, and they had to actually write down their best guess. And what we found was that kids were pretty accurate. So here's what the, the data looked like. So as you would expect, kids are, kids' guesses are approximate. They don't get to see what's in the cup, and they're really using their gut level sense of number to reason about what quantity was added. But the cool thing is that their guesses really cluster around about the hidden quantity. So when the hidden quantity, the quantity in one of the animal's cups was four, kids mean guess was around five, and there's a you know distribution around that. But that was pretty close to the quantity of four. And when the um, hidden quantity was 12, kids' mean guess was around 11.5, you know, 11.64. So that really suggests that kids are, you know, at this age, seven to nine years old, are doing pretty good at not only having a gut level sense of what gators and cheetahs magic cups are adding, but they're also pretty decent at mapping a numerical quantity onto that gut level sense of number. So I want to just talk to you a little bit about similar work that I've been doing with 15-month-old infants. Now this is unpublished data, but these are babies, 15-month-old babies, and I wanted to see whether they could do something a little bit similar. So obviously we can't ask the babies, you know, which cup is gators, which cup is cheetahs, but the, these experiments are designed along the same principle as um, some of those earlier exper experiments that I was talking to you about with familiarizing babies to something and then changing it up and seeing if they notice. So in these studies, 
15-month-old babies watched some events unfolding on a puppet show. So what they saw was a um, clear container with some number of pom-poms in it. And then the container was covered up, and babies saw a watering can actually adding some pom-poms behind the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Well, this is rather amazing that you can play like that with tiny babies, tiny, tiny ones. So um, I know um, some of us work with young kids. Uh, well, Salvador has, right? Melissa, just take your time. Uh, let us know when you feel better. So um, Salvador has a two-year-old and. Um, I know Rebecca here works with pretty young kids, All right? Um, so um, Gord may works with elementary kids and must be all solving uh, complicated problems. Um, and what what is what is interesting here in this experiment is that we don't require they don't require children to be precise. Many people noted that young kids and precision don't doesn't necessarily don't necessarily mix. So um, with very young kids, they can be precise, but within certain parameters. They, they are precise by recognizing that cheetah is different from gator. Won't confuse those two. But uh, with number, and yet a lot of um, elementary tasks, kindergarten tasks, you know, four-year-old tasks, somehow require children to be very precise, to do the sequential precision tasks, count exactly. Uh, draw particular numbers, and so on. So it's interesting how this studies, um, this studies use approximate numbers and just precise recognition of images. Uh, Melissa, I hope you are surviving there, but take your time, please. Just let us know when you're ready. Um, and um, this is just oh so don't don't lose your voice yeah um Gord said there is a snowstorm there uh, in Canada right oh okay so um mm -hmm. um while Melissa is uh, recuperating, I have an, kind of an, a longer consideration here that I want to pose in front of everyone. And I want to ask Melissa this question. But uh, it will take some time to formulate, so I might as well start now and save it up for, for later. But it's already, it's a it's about the first part of the presentation, so I can already do it. Um, it looks like there are almost several, there are several different ways humans approach numbers. So what Melissa is doing there um, is very different from counting this estimation or approximation. And then counting and the approximation is very different from precise recognition of small numbers called sabotizing. So there is counting, sabotizing, and that approximate number recognition. And then there is a hypothesis that um, says the, the the splitting conjecture uh, that there is another system for scaling, splitting, or inherently multiplicative structures. 
And I think Rebecca here from uh, Subquan Group is working with uh, that bit. So we have this, um, all these different systems for numbers, and it boggles my mind that we have that many different mechanisms for dealing with quantity and size. Um, uh, but, um, Sorry. I guess, uh, oh, yeah. You survived. Back. Good. <laughs> OK. Um, I apologize. Glad I'm getting over the calls. OK. Um, thank you, so thank I, you. Go ahead. I will. So um, that's a really great point about um, the different systems of number. Um, one of the things that we found, actually, is in a very recent study, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, is also unpublished, that um, kids don't seem to be able to do the gator task with very small numbers. So <clears throat> when uh, quantities are within the subitizing range, so under four, children have a really hard time with reasoning about a hidden quantity. And you know what's kind of interesting about that is that it's, it suggests that there's something about the approximate number system. So one of the systems that you mentioned, there's something about the approximate number system that lends itself well to this kind of computation, whereas the supertizing system doesn't seem to lend itself very well to that at all. This is something that we're very puzzled about, and uh, we're you know, trying to follow up with this. Um, I, I'm seeing that there's a, a question um, here. I just want to read it. <clears throat> so there's a couple of questions that came up. Um, so one is, um, are the answers that you're looking for during the experiment exact? Um, so one of the things about um, our experimental setup is that we're really not looking for an exact answer. And I think that's one of the things that actually helps children do the task. So when we have kids, let me just go back a couple of slides. Um, when we show kids this, this task um, with Gator and his you know, magic cup and his buttons, we don't even really give kids the opportunity to count. In fact, we don't want them to count. We just want to get their gut level sense of how, about how many buttons are there, about how many pennies, about how many um, objects did Gator's Cup add. And then when we give them their, the final test trial, um, I don't know what that little mysterious Z is there, but when we give them the uh, final uh, test trial, again, they're not supposed to count. They're just supposed to use their gut level sense of about how many things did Gator's Cup add. Now, interestingly, when we do the same task, but instead of showing kids quantities of objects, we tell them numbers. So in this particular setup, <coughs> instead of saying showing kids a set of buttons, we'll put a little box right here. And we'll say there are five buttons in the box. And then we'll, again, cover it up with a magic cup, lift the magic cup, and say, now there are 17 buttons. And kids do really bad at this. So they don't know what we're talking about. They have a really, really hard time. Now, again, these are four to six-year-olds. But when we do it with the um, with quantities of objects, kids succeed. So that really suggests that there's something about using their gut level number sense, not having to get the exact answer that's helping kids do this task. <clears throat> Let me just read these other questions here. Yeah, so what, yes, that's exactly right. One of, the, one of the answers is the correct answer. We've never actually done a version where we give them two wrong answers and ask them to guess the closest, but that's a really interesting idea. Um, it would be kind of cool to see if we forced kids to choose between two quantities, one that was a little bit closer, one that was a little bit farther away than the exact actual quantity whether kids would be biased to answer in one way or another. That's a really good question, but we haven't actually done that. <clears throat> Let me just scroll back to see if there's a few other questions here. Uh, 
Um, he said uh, the, their subitizing range at, at four to six is typically up to about four. Um, and let me see. Um, so, um, and I believe there's a question here um, about the infant study. So, this question from um, Gord at Math Pickle says, for the first exercise, does 5 to 10 and doubling 10 to 20 give the same surprise? Are you um, talking about the baby study? Or, okay, yeah, so there was a, a separate study. So, the one I told you about was about addition. But there was a separate study um, that looked at, I want to say it was older kids. So uh, now I believe these kids were in the three to five range, so not with babies. But there was a study that suggested that these kids could do a version of scaling so that they could, they kind of had the sense of, um, a multiplication by two or by three, and they were they were able to successfully choose which of two quantities should be the product of a multiplication. Um, but I'm not sure that that's ha that's been done with with young infants yet. Um, and let me just take a peek and see if there's any other questions they didn't answer yet that were that came up earlier. Oh, and there was a question of what fraction of five-month-old babies are surprised by a difference of X if you start with Y? Um, and is that related to gifted, giftedness? <laughs> Excuse me. It's difficult to tell um, with young babies whether there's a gifted element. Um, but it would be interesting to, you know, follow those babies later in life or, you know, look at it, but, um, look at it in older kids. But, um, you know, it is, it's difficult to tell with, with young babies. And, yeah, um, Maria is mentioning Piaget and Inhalder, um doing some scaling studies with toddlers right, way back, back in the day. Um, those are some really classic studies. And, yes, yeah, so with very different methodologies, definitely. Um, so let me just kind of head back to the 15-month-old um, babies where I, I had my unfortunate coughing fit. Um, so um, these babies, we wanted to give them, like I said, a task that was similar to the gator task. So infants saw a clear container with some pom-poms in it. Um, again, we covered up the um, container, and we showed them a watering can adding some pom-poms behind the screen. Now, kids didn't actually, the babies in this test, they didn't get to see what was in the watering can. We lifted the screen, and babies saw a new quantity. So babies, again, just like Gator's Magic Cup, they didn't get to see what the watering can added. They only got to see the starting state and the ending state. And then what we did was we showed babies babies um, test trials, so the babies saw this over and over. They saw this six different times, these familiarization trials, with different starting quantities, but <clears throat> the watering can always added the same number. Then babies saw an, a clear container placed on the stage. Again, it was covered up. The watering can added some uh, pom-poms behind the screen. And now here is the critical test. Have, babies half of the time saw the watering can add the same quantity that had, it had been adding on the familiarization trials. So, for example, if the watering can added six every time, the watering can added six on this critical test trial. <clears throat> For the other half of the test trials, the watering can added a different quantity. So if babies saw the watering can adding six over and over during the familiarization trials, on those test trials, they would see the watering can suddenly add 24. And again, the babies don't get to see the watering can actually adding. What we'll do is we'll lift the screen <clears throat> like this, and we show babies the expected outcome or the unexpected outcome. <clears throat> and what we find is that 15-month-old babies look longer at the unexpected outcome. So 
they expect that <clears throat> the watering can is adding a, should add a particular quantity, and they're surprised when suddenly it adds a new quantity. So this is kind of like having an expectation about what's in Gator's Magic Cup and being surprised when suddenly Gator's Magic Cup starts adding a new quantity. So this is some preliminary data with 15-month-old infants, but we think that it's pretty exciting. It really suggests that these kinds of pre-algebraic computations are there pretty early on and that kids can use them later on as they're, we hope, as they're starting to learn mathematics. <clears throat> so this is kind of the, the direction that we're going in in the future. So we know that kids seem to be able to harness their intuitive number sense to solve for x. They can solve these non-symbolic problems before they can solve symbolic problems. So one of our main questions for future research is, <clears throat> can we help kids use their intuitions about non-symbolic algebra to help them learn symbolic algebra? <clears throat> so some of the studies that we're going to be doing in the future are giving kids the opportunity to see Gator's Magic Cup, you know, that kind of, the kind of uh, scenario that we show them, you know, seeing Gator's Magic Cup, adding some quantities to um, different piles, giving them a chance to feel what it feels like to reason about Gator's Magic Cup as a hidden quantity, and then trying to make some links to symbolic math problems. So, <clears throat> for example, after seeing Gator's Magic Cup, um, you know, adding a hidden quantity, will kids be able to better solve a problem like 5 plus x equals 17 when it's presented to them with symbols? So that's one of the major directions that we're going in in the future. <clears throat> I have lots of other, you know, interesting things I'd like to do with this um, particular setup, but I'd be happy to talk to you guys more about that, and I'd love to get your questions and ideas about, um, about these, these studies. Excellent. So um, here is um, what we can do now. Thank you. Extremely interesting. I have about a million questions. Nobody can sabotage that. OK. So um, but what, um, people, so people can continue to type questions in chat. Or if you want to speak your question, there is a little button uh, that looks like a hand uh, that's over the list of names. If you press that button, uh, you, you signal us that you want to, to speak with the microphone. That's just so we don't all speak at once. So if anyone wants to ask a question by voice, just click that hand button, and um, you, can, you can do so. While people type the questions, um, let, me, let me ask one that came to mind. When you, when you say that uh, kids had hard time sabotaging answers to, with, with sabotaging range, um, there were some studies that the approximate number sense when trained, when kids are training to approximate, they get better at precise computation. And that's done with older kids. With, um, I believe they were um, something like 8 to 10 year olds. But it's interesting that you find that sabotaging doesn't help with computation. Uh, doesn't work this way with visual equations. Uh, do you think sabotaging can, can be harvested or harnessed? And if so, how? <clears throat> and that's a great question. We were actually surprised to find the result that we did with small numbers. Um, and <clears throat> one of the reasons that that might be is that um, it's thought that the representations, the mental representations that underlie small numbers, so objects in the subitizing range, of course, you know, I just want to say subitizing means you don't have to count, you just look at the quantity and that you, you, you see how many are there without counting. It's thought that the, those representations are difficult to compare to each other. So if I, you know, look at a, a set of objects and I see well, clearly there are three there, um, it's not necessarily apparent that that can be compared to, say, a set of two. Um, 
<clears throat> and that's that's interesting. Um, it, it's something that we overcome later in life by simply mapping numbers onto small quantities in the sympathizing range. And of course, we can compare two and three because we know about two and we know about three. Um, but it seems like children, at least you know, before they're they're good number word mappers, um, seem to have a you know, bit of a difficulty with at least doing these kinds of computations. Now, what's interesting is that they don't have trouble doing addition with sets of small numbers. So you can show them, you know, two buttons go in a cup, and then another one goes in a cup, and then they know that there are three in that cup. Um, but <clears throat> it doesn't seem to extend to something that's a little more complicated, which is back solving from a solution to get to a, an unknown add end. Um, but the question of whether kids can start to harness the, their supervising system, that's something that is definitely a question for, for future research. Um, it might be that kids need to use their ANS to figure out that they can use supervised representations to do algebra, but um, we'll have to see. Interesting, very interesting stuff. Um, and. Um, well, uh, so several people here are discussing using this in, with their kids or uh, trying different things, uh, changing things. So um, my next question to you is, Melissa, how can people help you with uh, the bigger community or different researchers, developers, parents, children, babies maybe? How, how can uh, people support your cause, so to speak? Um, that's a great question, and there's there's a lot of cool things coming up in the chat, so I just want to address them also really quickly. Um, I know Bill is saying that um, he'd like to try similar things, such as using lengths instead of sets of discrete elements. This is actually something we're working on right now. So instead of using discrete objects, we're doing things like changing volume or changing length. And we want to see whether kids can do similar computations with things like changes in volume or changes in continuous quantities instead of discrete quantities. So that's a really exciting area of research that we're moving into right now. Um, in terms of how people can help, um, one way is to obviously stay apprised of some of the current science work, which I, I really appreciate that the math education community is, is looking at this stuff. Um, and of course, my job as a scientist is to stay apprised of what's going on in the math education community. Um, we do definitely need a citizen science lab where people can offer experiments. I think that's a really, really great idea. Um, uh, one other way is to seek out researchers who are doing this kind of work. I'm not the only one working on number. There's a lot of people um, in labs all over that are working on this stuff. Um, if you have kids, you know, they love to participate, I'm sure. Um, but one thing is, you know, I, I especially, and, you know, I, I've thought about doing this for a long time, but now this, this might be spurring me on to just do it, is I would like to create a little web forum or um, something like this where math ed people can share their experiences doing the kinds of things that, for example, I talked about today. So like, if you've tried this in the classroom, how did it work? Did it, did it work okay? You know, did the kids like it? Um, what are the challenges you encountered? What kinds of, you know, what kinds of things did kids bring up to you? One of the main ways that I get new study ideas is by you know, seeing the way kids react to things that I say or things that they do. You know, kids are, are really good at telling you when something's weird or when something's not working. Um, yeah, and absolutely parents can try things with kids and share, you know, on the same forum. Um, I think that would be, that would be especially helpful just to, you know, allow us to communicate and share ideas. And, you know, in the meantime, I would love it if people, especially, you know, people in this in this uh, webinar right now would email me if they've tried things like that I've talked about today. So if you've tried something with your kindergarten class, 
um, let me know the results. You know, how, let's, you know, keep communicating um, because I think that, you know, the, the perspective that I'm coming from, which is from, you know, the cognitive psychology end, looking at approximate number system and things like this, you know, trying to really work on making it an applied science, working on getting this kinds of thing, these kinds of things into the classroom, it's really helpful for me to have feedback on people, parents, educators, trying this at home or trying this in the classroom. Um, so that kind of thing I think is especially helpful. Wow, how, how wonderful. Uh, we actually have, um, have a, a forum where something like that can happen. So uh, let's see if we can uh, start a place where people can send, send you feedback. Um, for my part, I, I had a really strange and puzzling experimental results with, well, uh, with my uh, subject, my, my kid, <laughs> when, when my kid was little. So uh, we did something um, following uh, the so-called splitting conjecture. So what we did, we didn't count, uh, but we did a lot of multiplicative experiments. So folding, cutting, um, doubling of all sorts, exponential growth using computer tools. And uh, somehow uh, in mathematics education, a lot of people find that um, um, a lot of people find uh, that children tend to to have this additive misconceptions where they assume everything is counting or in the additive world. And um, my kid kind of grew up the opposite, so assumed everything is exponential and tried to double or triple or exponentiate all the time. So that's uh, one reason I was very interested in comparing different ways the no number or quantity originates. And I think Bill here has the same interest with lens, with visual quantities, and then um, uh, I know Rebecca and Rebecca's group is working with uh, a multiplicative system, subquon algebraic system. So uh, I think ma math educators uh, have these different views on that. So uh, Light has a question that's an admin question. Uh, yes, this will be recorded and we'll have this recording in the same system on the on the page um, very soon after the event and then Afterwards, we'll have a video on YouTube um, in about a week or so. It takes time to process. Uh, so, uh, yes. Um, okay. Um, right. Um, so, so um, we we can have more questions. Uh, Rebecca's talking about uh, the system they developed with small numbers, but organizing them by powers uh, in a very visual way. So that's a multiplicative system. Um, maybe, um, Melissa, you can visit the Second Life Island sometimes and see how, how that works. Uh, but um, anyway, um, so I, I have a I have a question we, we ask our visitors um, everyone who comes to this series we start started a while ago can you share a story from when you were a little kid yourself a mathematical story some people have this mathematical stories and it's always nice to share sure um, so. I think that this one um, is indicative of how my approach has been to mathematics. Um, you know, I'm a scientist, and I've always, even as a kid, approached things like a science. So <clears throat> to me, the most intuitive, or the, 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 you know, most interested I've been in math is when I've been able to do experiments to find the answer. And I, one of my, you know, fondest memories of, of kind of being a, a little bit of a nerd as a kid is that there was a, um, my path, path of walking to school was at a right angle and there was a kind of a path worn through the grass that made the hypotenuse of the angle. And 
every day coming to and from school, I would time my walk to get it so that if someone was walking on the right angle, I was walking on the hypotenuse at the same speed and vice versa. And I spent a lot of time trying to experimentally verify um, the relationship between the hypotenuse and the and the uh, legs of the of the triangle. It's not. I didn't end up coming up with the Pythagorean theorem or anything from this, but this was just the kind of thing that I wanted to use experiments, even as a little kid, to figure out mathematical principles. And that's something that I I've brought to I think my research on algebra is, you know, w with these kids doing you know reasoning about Gator's Magic Cup, they're doing basically hidden cause reasoning, which is something that we do in science all the time. What was the cause of this outcome? And something that is kind of my big picture idea about helping kids learn math is to help them see it as a little bit of a science, help them to try to do experiments to figure out the answer. Um, so that's kind of the way that I've always approached learning math. And I, I think it would be, it, it's an interesting thing to, to see if we can help kids learn more complex mathematics by helping them apply experimental principles to math. Um, it's interesting. What you, what you just say sounds so interesting. It connects a little bit in my mind to Montessori education where tasks are supposed to be, uh, there is a term self-correcting, that is, uh, when a child does something, the device itself, the manipulative, has to give feedback that is obvious to the child of what happened. The, the observation must be, it's not the authority of another person that tells the child if it's right or not, but the device itself, the child must observe uh, if something worked or didn't and how. Uh, so that's a design principle, and you're using this design principle in experimentation. Um, I want to ask you a big question, Melissa. So um, you probably, as many researchers, dream big. Where do you see this going in the long run? So if everything works out and a lot of people do this, kind of gain this understanding, what do you hope to understand in the big scheme of things, and where is it going for the world if you do? Well, that's a very big question, um, but I, the, the direction that I see this going, you know, the reason that I do what I do is because I am puzzled every day by how human beings can make sense of such a complex world. Um, and the reason I study kids, one of the reasons that I study kids is that they provide this glimpse into a very, you know, a, an almost simpler form of cognition. And we can start to look at the building blocks of human cognition when we look at how kids develop and how they learn. And part of that part of that, you know, research agenda that I'm sort of in, interested in general and how do we make sense of this, this crazy world that we live in, <clears throat> part of that is can we help kids and even adults use their, you know, intuitions about how the world works to learn things that are much more complex than they ever might have learned before. And a lot of this applies to my work in mathematics, obviously looking at algebraic reasoning and um, early math abilities. But this could also be things like physics. So for example, young infants have expectations about how physical objects should behave. They have expectations about gravity. They know that two objects can't occupy the same space at the same time. They have these, these kinds of Newtonian um, ideas about how objects should behave. Could we get kids to harness those intuitions about physics, object physics, in a very basic way, to learn more complex ideas about physics later on? I mean, there are all kinds of applications that I can see for helping kids have 
a better understanding of the scientific and mathematics world. That's kind of the, the general approach that I take and, and what I'm hoping to um, accomplish with the kinds of research that I do. Oh, wow. And you mentioned uh, that it can help adults. Um, so it's interesting. I, I found that in my work as well, um, and uh, probably a lot of people here, <laughs> some people here in this room who work with both children and adults uh, can attest to that, that when you develop something for young children, uh, a lot of parents thank you and a lot of adults who have anxieties or difficulties with math because uh, if a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a toddler can understand it, they get some hope from it or they see their children enjoy it and then start enjoying it as well. So um, have you had parents tell you tell you they understood how algebra works finally or something like of that nature? Um, you know, that's that's a great question. <clears throat> a lot of times parents are almost like, wow, I can't believe my kids got that. I wasn't, you know, paying attention enough to understand what you were doing. That's typically what we observe with parents. But um, I've, I've had a lot of parents who are intrigued by the ideas that we're doing, um, mostly for in terms of educating their kids. <clears throat> but again, a lot of the the things that we've been studying so far, you know, one one unknown add end problems that are pretty simple for adults to understand. <clears throat> These things are very simple. And my guess is that if we started to get into more complex ideas, and this is like um, maybe combining multiple variables together or learning um, concepts about quantum physics this isn't something that I've ruled out. Um, I think that parents might start to learn a little bit of um, something from these kinds of studies that we're doing with kids. But, you know, the kinds of representations that we're, that we're looking at are, they're not just something, things that kids have, right? Um, the approximate number system, subitizing, all of these things that we've been talking about over the past hour, these are all things that adults have as well. Um, so I think it's absolutely um, true that some of the things that we discover might actually help adult learners as well. Um, okay, we have um, uh, we have uh, just about five minutes, so uh, I see people typing. I um, we have time for a couple more questions, so. Uh, Bill um, and everybody, uh, you can leave comments for Melissa or your contact information um, in on the pages uh, where you found this event. Uh, they have uh, they have uh, contact. Uh, they have comment sections, and also uh, Melissa, you, you you have an online page, right? How can people get in touch with you? Um, so because because some people are interested in communicating, uh, so um, so before we go, um, just um, I want I want to say uh, that we live in in interesting times and we live in good times now for for this better than I guess uh, ever before it's cumulative of course uh, but I I really hope this this studies can change things and not just for kids but as you say it in the answer to the big question it uh, it can change how we approach education in general yes and I do think that People who work in mathematics education, people who work in psychology, maybe even uh, neuroscientists, uh, people who, who study things at uh, uh, much more fine-grained level 
and biological perspectives, we can all work together to un untangle some of these puzzles. Uh, why can't kids use subitizing to solve equations intuitively? Why can multiplication be easier than addition? Uh, what happens to all that when we grow? There are so many questions. So, um, Melissa, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming and sharing your research. Let, let us keep in touch with you about your future studies. So I hope you can continue sharing with mathematics educators. Definitely. And thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. Um, I posted in the chat window um, my website and my email address. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me, they can do it through my website. Or you can just um, go to the BU Psychology Department website, and you can find me through there at Boston University. Um, but I definitely love to keep in touch with everyone. and. Um, stay updated with what people are doing on the forum, um, it'd be really great to get um, everyone's feedback and ideas about future studies and you know, share some ideas back and forth. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm going to stop the recording, and it will be on the event pages after that. Melissa, thank you very much. Thank you.